it's me again. Hello, hello. Look, the tummy ache survivors are gathering. Hello, 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 hello. The level of excitement that I have this week for dis gosh, this surprises this happen every week to me. The level of the level of excitement that I have for discussing the Met Gala this week is absolutely unmatched. I am stoked. When I found out about this theme, I was ready to discuss. I've got a lot of predictions on that, a lot of hopes, a lot of dreams, and a lot of speculating that I need to do with you. I'm Alex Clark. This is Politics Live, where I cover weekly entertainment news without the leftist propaganda. Are you shaking, queen? Are you shaking, queen? Thumbs up this video right meow. Subscribe to Real Alex Clark on YouTube. We are here for the Hello Kitty boiling. Let the Hello Kitty boiling commence. Today we will boil Hello Kitty live on YouTube. Hide your kids, hide your wife. But actually, a rebrand is coming, a rebrand is coming. 200,000 subscribers, I'm just rattling off facts. Some innocuous, some not. Maybe all, maybe no. Maybe yes, maybe no. 200,000 subscribers! Finally, the suits have a pep in their step. If you know, you know. I will tell you! I will tell you the Mad Gala theme! And everything we know so far, plus some of my juiciest predictions for the biggest fashion night of the year. And as a little one-off on this, I want to talk about Pookie. You know that movie, We Need to Talk About Kevin. I think it's about a school shooter. But you know the movie, We Need to Talk About Kevin. Well, we need to talk about Pookie. Why is Bobby Altoff's divorce ruining my life? And an incredible article that I found about the epidemic of asexuality and how it's probably due to a generation being prescribed antidepressants. I should also tell you that Turning Point USA. Ugh. I should also tell you that Turning Point USA's huge women's conference, the Young Women's Leadership Summit, has officially been announced. Maybe we'll boil all of Hello Kitty's Sanrio friends at the event. That event is San Antonio, June 7th through 9th. I'm pretty sure that this was changed because there was a massive pride flag at the hotel that we always held it at previously. Last year, Charlie Kirk kind of went in a rager about that on stage. Kind of an epic move, if that is why we changed to San Antonio. Nobody's officially told me that, but I've heard, I've heard through the grapevine in the office, behind the scenes tea alert, not confirmed. I don't want CK's PR people calling me, Alex, stop. Don't get us into trouble. I mean, I don't know why we'd be in trouble. I mean, you know, it's still, it would be, it would be positive for our audience. But anyways, YWS is June 7th through 9th. And I know that it is the word young in it. I think that's going to be changing very soon. Um, not this year, but probably by next year, we're going to drop the young because it's confusing to people. But... The Young Women's Leadership Summit. It's not just for those who are young. It's also for those who are just young at heart. Any age can go. All ages. You are considered a student. So people are like, well, I don't know. What am I? I'm 24, but I'm not in college. And I don't know what to buy. And I'm telling you, if it says, if you are 26 or younger, you can buy a student price ticket. If you are 26 or older, you buy an adult ticket. And that's it. Bada boom, bada bing. It's really not hard. There will be a mother's room if you have a baby or if you're bringing Hello Kitty to boil. Otherwise, you know the maturity level of your daughter. Now, I have seen people ask me about this. I have seen kids there as young as seven, nine years old or so. Um, but, you know, they're really into the subject matter. They're really into the topics. Maybe they love listening to the spillover with their mom. If that is your daughter and you're like, she would actually love this, you should bring her. But if you've got a seven-year-old iPad kid, I will speak for all of us when I say, please don't. Is that controversial? I think I'm just looking out for everybody else. Don't bring your iPad kid that's going to, you know, go into a tantrum because they're not playing Candy Crush every 30 seconds. Don't bring that. But if you've like a cool kid who's normal and well-behaved and mature for their age, I think, like, someone that young would be good, I mean, with an adult, don't, like, send them and just drop them off, you know, this isn't daycare, but I have seen kids that young 
there with parents before. Otherwise, um, I would say this event is great for teens or older. Um, and yeah, there is going to be a mother's room. There were so many moms last year and so many people needing to like breastfeed or whatever that I, I said, please, going forward, every event, we have to have a mother's room set up. So there will be that. Anyway, um, speakers will be announced soon. I know that we are reaching out to some of the biggest guests that I've had on The Spillover in the last year. So that's really exciting. And here is the deal with ticket pricing. Until March 1st, anyone 26 or under can get a student ticket for $25. That is so freaking cheap. Until March 1st, if you are under 26, you can get $25 or less, plus 25% off with code Alex. If you are over 26, you can get an adult ticket for only $50 until March 1st. Uh, Plus 25% off with code Alex. So that's pretty much free. YWLS2024.com. YWLS2024.com. Code Alex for that additional 25% off. Again, the dirt cheap tickets only until March 1st. After that, I don't want anybody crying to me. So... There it is, YWLS2024.com. Anyway, let's get into the stories. The 2024 Met Gala theme has been revealed. The Met is going to be celebrating a new exhibition. And so, you know, they do like a whole at the, at the um, whatever, the art place, the Met. They do like a whole art exhibition and that kind of base is what this event is going to be off of. And this year it is Sleeping Beauties Reawakening Fashion. That's what the exhibit is about and I'll explain what that means. The theme of the event is Garden of Time. It's May 6th and the exhibition will be shaped around three main zones. So it's very nature themed. Garden of time. You get a lot of floral there. Land, sea, and sky. They're going to be paying tribute to the natural world. And Vogue said it is very much an ode to nature and the emotional poetics of fashion. There will be pieces in the art exhibit that people go see that are too fragile to be worn again. So that's like kind of a hint. Too fragile to be worn again. They say it's all a metaphor for the evolution of human history and the endless cycle of creation and destruction. Now, the 2024 Met Gala co-chairs are none other than, drum roll please, Bad Bunny, Chris Hemsworth, what? Jennifer Lopez. Oh, God. Please, no. God, no. And Zendaya. Good with that. Everyone else, absolute WTF, all capital letters. Immediate no for J-Lo as a co-chair. She is, and please pull up these pictures. She is a huge fashion ick for me. I hate J-Lo's taste. I need you to reminisce with me. Remember her live, laugh, love wedding? Her live, laugh, love wedding to Ben Affleck. This is like, when did they get married? Last year? In the last two years? It's atrocious, vile, indecent. Throw it away in the garbage, light it on fire. The gag I gupped. The fonts, the paint on the wood. I'm sorry to the Midwest moms. I'm from the Midwest too, okay? So before you freak out, but let's call a spade a spade. We have typically Midwesterners, especially ones that have never lived anywhere else, horrible taste. And that's what this is giving. J-Lo gives Midwest mom to me. She is not the vibe, in my opinion, to be a co-chair of the Met Gala, the biggest event in fashion every year. On that note, I also do not understand Chris Hemsworth being involved at all. I mean, I've never heard his name be uttered in terms of like some kind of like fashion icon or whatever. I, I mean, I, I don't even know anything. I, I, I am just totally in the dark. If there's something I'm missing when it comes to him, I guess tell me. But, you know, he is not somebody like even like um, Jay Leto. Right. Isn't he somebody, am I think Jared Leto, why am I saying Jay? Jared Leto is somebody who, like, loves the Met Gala, like, takes it very seriously and the theme every year. Like, that's somebody that would make more sense to me for them to be like, hey, 
Jared Leto is going to be a co-chair. Okay. But Chris Hemsworth, who, <laughs> what? I guess they just need a guy, you know, for their DEI purposes or whatever to throw in there. They got to give somebody that. But I, I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Now, here's the other thing. Vogue was very adamant to say, remember how I said that the theme, they said sleeping beauties, reawakening fashion. Vogue was very adamant to say the forthcoming show has not to do, nothing to do with the Brothers Grimm or Disney, but rather a celebration of clothing and fragile fashion that can never be worn again. Thus, sleeping beauties in the scrupulous archives of the Costume Institute. Now, if they're talking about things that are too fragile to be worn again as the theme, I wonder if Kim Kardashian wearing Marilyn Monroe's dress would have been better suited for this year event. Remember, she wore that dress of Marilyn Monroe's, very controversial, because it was, like, never supposed to be worn because it could just, like, break off. And she did lose some pieces wearing it because that's how fragile it was. I mean, it's been sitting, you know, in a case or whatever at, like, Ripley's Believe It or Not for, like, decades or something. I can't remember what. But it's like, I wonder if that then would have been on theme for this event. Not sure. Um, I think, obviously, the garden of life. Expect tons of florals. Florals, groundbreaking. Maybe clocks. Garden of time. Maybe some clock situations. Land, sea, and sky are the sub-themes. I think there's going to be a lot of fun stuff done with that. And, again, materials that are too fragile, as you can see in the inspiration video based on the art gallery thing for this, the exhibit, Materials too fragile to be worn again. So like a dress, I think we're going to see like dresses made of weird things like dress, like they have a dress made of butterflies here. Like that would be beautiful. So something like that would be crazy, like a dress made of real butterfly wings or something like that. You know, liberal tears, that kind of stuff. I think Taylor and Travis are going to be making this their first red carpet appearance. Honestly, perfect event for them. In my opinion, he loves fashion. Say what you want. He loves fashion. He has a lot of fun dressing up, being on theme, costumes, the whole shebang. She has a love-hate relationship with the Met Gala. She's met lots of exes there, uh, lots of drama to come out of the Met Gala for her. So she kind of like goes sometimes and sometimes doesn't. But I think because she's dating Travis, I think they will go. I think that this year's theme, the Garden of Life and all that will really fit her aesthetic very well and suit her. Taylor does have a break in her tour schedule that would allow her to go, so that's important. Now, TikTok is an honorary chair of the event, which I hate, but also knowing that which TikTokers would be going, this is who I want to see. So I made sure to write this down. Octopus lover, Jake Shane. Now you say, now why why are we bringing up Jake Shane? And I'll tell you why. Number one, his personality is amazing hilarious but he is best friends with none other than Sophia Richie. Sophia Richie of course one of the it girls of the moment. She's expecting her first child, just had like one of the most epic social media weddings of all time, celebrity weddings of all time. Sophia Richie, Jake Shane sitting, okay? Hear me out. He's also a huge Swifty. Taylor Swift invited him to go to the Eras tour, put him in the VIP tent. They know each other. She likes his videos. So here's what I'm saying. A Taylor and Travis table, Sophia and her husband and Jake Shane sitting at the table. So much fun. Two of the biggest it girls together at one of the biggest nights in fashion. Absolute yes. Okay. Then Pookie and Jet. We have to talk about Pookie. Pookie and Jet are an absolute must for the Met Gala. Now, look at this recent outfit that she just wore to Fashion Week somewhere. I can't remember where, which Fashion Week. I was deceased. Deceased by the corset. I think it commented that on her picture. I said, like, I'm murdered by the corset. So good. Again, normally, I wouldn't like seeing, I don't like seeing influencers at any of these events. I really don't. But the decision has been made for us. And so I'm just, you know, we have no choice. And so if I have no choice in the matter, these are the people. If, if, if TikTokers, if influencers have to go, then these are the influencers I want to see. And I think I am good at choosing who would make sense to go to this event. Obviously, this couple, they're known for their high fashion looks. 
she can fit in with this crowd. She just got her little Birkin. We all know the whole story. So, you know, she fits. And he's absolutely amazing. I cannot get enough of them. I think she is the perfect example. And this is kind of like a little out of pocket for me to bring up, but like, I don't care. She is the perfect example of doing the exact right tweak to your face to bring out your uniqueness instead of doing some kind of plastic surgery or or getting stuff done, you know, fillers, Botox, whatever, doing something that makes you uh, to take away your difference and look like everybody else, look like an Instagram filter. Everybody looks like a TikTok filter. Pookie, if you look at her before and afters, which I'm obsessed with, I poured over all of those one night and spent hours going like deep in her Instagram. She totally looks different, but like not so different that it's like, who is this person? Like, you know, it's her, but she just looks better. And she did something with her eye area that like made her eyes pop even more than they already were, which they were already popping. The eyes were pookieing already, but now they do so even more. She's like a little cracked out mouse all the time. And I live for it. Something about it is so chic. And I love that we are living in this moment where we have all of these like young married couples that are just like bigger than ever. Like people love seeing this healthy relationship. Like they're living for this healthy relationship, like a husband doting on his wife, his wife respecting him immensely because of the way he treats her. Like the whole circle is just like perfection. Everybody loves them. Everybody, everybody. Now, Here's who doesn't love them, the the haters and the losers and the stinkers who hate seeing people be happier than they are. And those are the people who tried to dig up bad stuff on them and they couldn't find anything that they couldn't find anything on Jet. The only thing they could find on Jet was that he was a genius, makes a lot of money and just he's just like the sweetest vanilla guy who nobody ever has anything bad to say about now. All they found on her, and I'm saying found on her, which I think it's ridiculous. All they could find on her was that she attended an uh, she attended an antebellum dress up party in college, which oh brother, you know they always try to make that something. It's nothing. Remember when they threw this big stink over Matt James, the Black Bachelor, the girl Rachel, isn't it Rachel? Her name? I didn't watch that season. Who he liked? He wanted to pick her. And then it came out that when she was in college in the South, because all Southern colleges did this until like two years ago, they do these sorority, fraternity, antebellum themed dress up parties, you know, on plantations or whatever. So they freaked out about Rachel. They made they did this huge humiliation ritual at like after the final rose, made her like ball her eyes out and, and apologize and swear up and down she wasn't racist. He was chastising her, telling her she was disgusting, like, you know, I think so different of you now, and made her feel like a horrible person, embarrassed her in front of the entire country. And then, of course, it was a crock of crap. The fake outrage was unreal and they ended up dating anyway and they're still together today like years later like she's who he was going to choose the whole time Matt chose her the whole time knew it but the producers and everybody made him throw this huge humiliation ritual to her and then she freaking obliged and then dated him after that she should have never in my opinion continued to date him after he was willing to go along and do that to her but you know she's white so she deserves it anyway Pookie and Jet forever. And I cannot wait for their baby era. When they inevit- when they start having kids, that's going to be like am- amazing seeing that dynamic shift into parenthood for them. Love them. Now, the other couple who needs to be at the Met Gala, influencer couple of the moment, is PB and J and Lucky Smith. You have no idea who I'm talking about. I know you don't. Her real name is Nara. But I call her PB and J because she went viral making that peanut butter and jelly sandwich at her toddler's request completely, completely from scratch. Her husband is Lucky Smith. He is a famous supermodel. And she is also I believe she's also a former model. Maybe she's not modeling now because she's doing, you know, motherhood and she's doing the influencing thing with motherhood and baking everything from scratch that you could ever think of. I mean, this girl, you could say like. Uh, she she'll be like, I'm gonna pour my toddler a cup of water from scratch. I mean, and then somehow she's like creating water. She's got molecule droplets, and I don't even know. I've never seen anything like this. Every aspect of this peanut butter sandwich was from scratch, and people just couldn't believe it. That's why it's viral. She'll make lasagna totally from scratch, and I mean, she's milling flour, and every little thing is homemade. 
It's very interesting. She's stunning. He's stunning. They are the hottest couple I have ever seen. You have to look at pictures of these people. He is actually a supermodel. And so they're actually fashion. That's what I like about these people. So they're famous now, or she's famous for being like this influencer mother, but he's also famous in his own right because he's a model. It makes sense for them to be at the Met Gala for all of these reasons. They're young. Again, the young married couple's blowing up. They're young. They're married. They have kids. They're hot. I love popular culture rewarding young families. It is such a freaking vibe right now. Imagine these two on the Met Gala red carpet. I could freaking scream. If they are not there, but they're making TikTok a co-chair and they're inviting influencers and they are not there, then Anna Wintour has dementia. She needs to be taken out to pasture. Something's going on there. I don't know how you could overlook this couple. Crucial. Now, again... If TikTok has to be involved, I want Brittany Broski doing the interviewing. Brittany Broski needs to be doing the interviewing purely because she is one of the funniest comedians on the planet. She was born, she was born from a meme. She was born from a literal meme, born and bred from a meme. I can scroll and watch her videos for hours. Her and Emma Chamberlain on the red carpet are gold. They ask funny questions. They ask interesting questions. They're endearing. They're not jackasses. They're not jackasses like some dude the other night. I can't remember what was that, the People's Choice Awards or something. He went up to America Ferrer, Ferreira, some TikToker, and was like, would you rather have a gay son or thought daughter, like a freaking moron? Those are the exact influencers who should not be invited to these types of events. He'll never be invited back, I'm sure. But America Ferrera was mortified, and obviously, so was everyone else. Now, when it comes to this, like, fragile things that can never be worn again because they're so precious and perfect and timeless, would the yellow dress from How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days count as something for that? Doubt it. But I just, I need, I've been thinking about this for months, I need a celebrity to wear that dress on the right carpet soon, just like Kim was able to go wear from the archives the literal, you know, Marilyn Monroe's dress. I need someone to wear the literal yellow dress from How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. I hope somebody somewhere, Kate Hudson or whatever, has that dress in a little safe and somebody can wear it. Thumbs up this video. Subscribe to Real Alex Clark on YouTube or on the podcast version if you listen there. Christy says, popular culture rewarding marriage and families. Yes! Everyone agrees that PB&J and her husband are actually fashion. Oh, Lindsay says, I used to love Lucky in high school. Yeah, because he was like a Tumblr. He was like a Tumblr guy, right? Like everybody like shared his photos on Tumblr. That would make sense. Okay, why I cannot stop obsessing, crying, and slitting my wrists over Bobby Altoff's divorce announcement. Bobby Altoff announced she's getting divorced. Now, she blew up this year for her awkward celebrity interviews. She plays this very, like, blasé character. You've definitely seen her if you don't know her name. She first started as a mommy blogger on TikTok with her husband and two kids. Now, I have an unpopular opinion on this, and I also want to stress that obviously we have zero context uh, uh, surrounding, you know, the purpose or the, the reason for this divorce. I could very well be wrong. I could very well be wrong. But as soon as she started raking in millions of views to interview famous people, be in high fashion campaigns, she became a millionaire overnight, she's going to Drake concerts without her husband, all of that. I wondered how long it would take for this to happen. I just, I wonder, I just, it was in the back of my mind. It was in the back of, the, um, of my mind. And again, could be none of these reasons why they got divorced. I have no idea what happened. Um, could be none of these reasons, could be one of these reasons. Either he couldn't take her success and money, felt inadequate, you know what I mean? Felt threatened, which the feminists are going to argue. Or she has not been holding up her bargain as a wife and a mother with all of these sudden opportunities. 
Now, that's very unpolitically correct of me to say, bring up, theorize about, I get that. And again, I don't know that totally maybe she was ab, like abs, actually crushing. Maybe he went off and ran off on her. You know what I mean? And while she's been busy, when she gets home, she's present. She's home. But when she's gone, he's lonely and he shacked up with somebody. We have no idea. But I'm just speculating as you do. And I just wonder if that could have played a part. I'm worried it's the latter. You know, was she suddenly doubting is my life at home married to this guy with kids is this enough suddenly is she is it being you know told to her that like you could have more than this you should want more than this and then does that fuel insecurities feelings of inadequacy you know la- f- fueling this idea that I, I I don't have a purpose you know being a wife and a mother it's just a worry and as soon as she started raking in millions of views to interview famous people and be invited to do all this, I just thought, you know, it would be incredibly hard also, I will say, for any parent, husband or wife to become a Internet celebrity overnight, a millionaire overnight on your own without your spouse. So it's not like as a couple they start doing this podcast or making videos and they become this viral Internet couple, couple like Pookie and Jet, for example. Like imagine like Pookie and Jet, only Jet becomes famous like out of nowhere for stuff he posts online, all of the attention, all of the money, all of the ad deals, the time away, the travel to, to attend these events, the strain that would take on a marriage. And then you have kids in the mix. Like, I'm just like, bro, like that is crazy. And it truly happened overnight. And so I just wondered how long it would take for this to happen. And I think anyone would find that difficult to still be interested in putting your spouse first when you have all this money and opportunity and you're surrounded by A-list celebrities all the time. It just broke my heart to see this announcement about her and her husband getting divorced. I mean, when I saw it, I just, I was like, oh, those kids, just the whole thing made me sad. They're also a young, cute, attractive couple. I think her husband's super cute. I think she is gorgeous, gorgeous. Her, like, dressed up for these fashion campaigns is stunning. Her on the red carpet, stunning. I think she's, per- like, she also has a perfect body to me. So, you know, all of it, I'm just like, man, this girl is just so primed up to be swooned easily out of her. Very, you know, what I would assume would have been, in, like, a normal happy life. But maybe it wasn't. I don't know. We don't know. But I'm just, you know, I'm just ripping it with you. I'm just ripping it. We don't know anything. But look how sad. I'm just so sad. Anyway, the internet man. Delcy says her husband is successful in his own right, so she definitely was the issue. Some are speculating in the chat that she did sleep with Drake. Because remember, she interviews Drake. That was her first viral interview. Racked up over 10 million views. Not too long after that, Drake freaks out and then forces her to delete the interview. She had to delete the interview. He, like, unfollowed her on everything. It was like clearly they had a falling out. Now, over what? I don't know. But it was right after he flew her out to go to her concert, go to his concert. Lindsay says she rubs me the wrong way. I've got a bias, but I speculate she got successful and was looking at her husband and thinking I can do better. Someone says she left her kid on their first birthday. Clearly, she isn't committed to her family. Ooh, I have not seen that. Very sad. Okay, the last thing I want to bring up is the rise in asexuality due to a rise in antidepressants. So I saw a fire piece written by a woman named Freya India this week. It was an article that had this title, and she said, you deserve to know if your sexuality is a side effect. Powerful, powerful. Now, this article is not super long, so I'm just going to read it or read most of it, jump around here, because it's just, it's a really good article. It's like a Substack article, you know what I mean? So Freya writes, and I may be, I I apologize if I pronounced the name wrong. 
Gen Z is often described as a sexless generation. We are having less sex than previous generations did at the same age. We are less likely to have been on a date. Most of us, most of us identify as asexual. In fact, according to the Stonewall report, more Gen Z Brits, this girl's British, more Gen Z Brits identify as asexual than gay or lesbian. Now, asexual, you're not interested in sex, period. You're not interested in any gender, period. You're nothing. You're like a genderless newt. All kinds, she writes, all kinds of cultural and social influences could explain this. Early exposure and addiction to porn might be one. Definitely agree. Uh, she's written about that, she says. But there's also a medical explanation, more specifically the widespread use of SSRIs and their sexual side effects. SSRIs, Again, this is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I talked about this with Dr. McPhillin uh, in December on our episode. If you click that box there, it says re continue reading or something like that where you don't have to like sign up. Yeah. So I talked to Dr. Roger McPhillin about this. This is Prozac, Lexapro, Zoloft. She said something well established about these drugs is that they have sexual side effects. In fact, between 40% and 65% of people who take an SSRI are thought to experience some form of sexual dysfunction. And we talked about this. He said this was very important to him to bring up in the interview with me, Dr. McPhillin, because he was like, people do not know this, that there are people that take this and it, hap it can happen instantly. You don't have to be because I was like, well, do you have to be on the drug for a long time? Like, is this only people that take the drug for years? And he was like, no, it can literally be an instant permanent side effect that you experience like a total change in sexual desire, genital numbness, erectile dysfunction, all this kind of stuff. So she wrote, she's quote, you know, has tons of studies quoted. She says between 40 and 65 percent of people who take an SSRI are thought to experience some form of sexual dysfunction. What few people know, though, is that the side effects persist even after quitting the drugs, a condition called post SSRI sexual dysfunction or PSSD. This is, in fact, more than just low libido. It can be a total loss of libido. What I said, genital numbness, erectile dysfunction, an inability to orgasm, and a complete lack of sexual attraction. Sorry, I should have said, like, a kid warning before this. I didn't think to. Um, so, hey, kids, you might want to pause this and then come back to it later when your kids aren't in the room. Um, emotional blunting is also common with SSRIs, which sufferers describe as a numbing of positive emotions, no romantic feelings, and difficulty connection, connecting with others. It can occur immediately after just a few pills and persist for years, decades, even permanently. This is so terrifying. This should be being shouted from the rooftops. This is the conversation that should be had with every single patient when they walk into the doctor's office and they say, I'm experiencing some anxiety at work like I did a couple years ago. And then it was, okay, well, how about we try Lexapro? Okay, goodbye. Have a nice day. That was the consultation. No one told me about this. Do you see? This is where the problem comes in. And then I have some of you sensitive Sallies who like freak out, even conservatives who freak out and say like, I'm sick of Alex bringing up things about birth control. I'm sick of Alex talking about the dangers of SSRIs. I'm sick of Alex talking about Ozempic, which I haven't talked much about, but I've kind of hinted at it and that already like triggered everybody. You have no, I'm telling you respectfully, you have no idea what you're talking about, how terrifying these drugs are. They are numbing, they are castrating, and they are, they are exasperating a slew of chronic illnesses for an entire generation of Americans. That is why I'm fired up. It's not because I, I hate fat people or whatever. I, it's not because I hate women it, and, I, and I'm championing Christian, Christian uh, nationalism or what the heck Politico said yesterday in an article that I was, I was linked to again. They keep saying this because I speak out against hormonal birth control. It's just so dishonest and, and dangerous and harmful to discredit the things that, and not just me, but 
So many people are trying desperately. We're, we're clawing at the at the edges, trying to bring this to public attention. And then especially because I happen to be conservative, I'm quieted because I'm, I'm, I'm you know, it's this is some kind of right wing conspiracy or just trying to. I don't know what the, I don't know what this is. It's it's like everything I say is is there's no credit because I'm conservative. And so there, therefore we shouldn't listen to the things that I'm bringing up. There, Many of you have blood on your hands and many of you will have to answer to God about this, the censorship over this, the dishonest reporting over this that has happened to me um, at uh, five or six times alone in the last year. I can think of Washington Post, Politico multiple times, MSNBC, NBC News, Media Matters, all of these people mentioning me in articles saying that I'm spreading disinformation. And all they can say is health experts disagree. Alex Clark says, blah, 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 you know, whatever I say. And I always and I and I back up what I'm saying or I've got I have experts on that can back up what I'm saying. And then it's just like, well, health ex- experts disagree or um, not clear why conservative, uh, you know, prominent conservatives are bringing this up or whatever. She says one in three teenagers in the UK, 12 to 18 years old, has been prescribed antidepressants. In 2022 alone, the number of children taking uh, antidepressants rose by 6,000. Holy. In 2022 alone, the number of kids aged 13 to 19 in the United Kingdom rose 6,000 kids to 173,000 kids under 19 years old taking genital numbing, sexuality numbing prescriptions that can alter you for life. Tell me this isn't the most important, one of the most important things of our time to be talking about this. And again, we're only talking about these problems with SSRIs. The Ozempic stuff, mind-blowing. The hormonal birth control stuff, mind-blowing. But I've already talked a lot about that. But the Ozempic is coming. The Ozempic is coming. And many of you who have been sensitive over it because you struggle with weight are going to be eating your words. That was that was like a bad... I didn't, that was like no pun intended there. But you will be eating your words. And you will be thankful that I brought it up because the stuff that is coming out, and I mean rapid fire on the day... The stuff that is coming about about Ozempic, um, it's like we're talking about like Nazi experiment level stuff that's happening now to people. You will be thankful that we brought this up, even though it's uncomfortable and, and even though it sucks. If you struggle with things, I, I get I get that it sucks to not be able to have a quick pill to fix it. But that's that's the truth, right? There's never a quick pill to fix anything. Nothing is free without a cost. This article is fascinating. Um, It's not too much longer, but I think you get the gist. It's very frightening. And she talks about how, you know, this because we see this huge rise in kids saying, well, I'm asexual. I'm not attracted to anybody. I have no desire to have sex. Um, You know, all these things that like basically drive a society. Every culture in human history drives them to want to get married and have kids, all that stuff. That drive is being taken from them. And so then we're seeing the effects. It's like uh, there's so many factors that goes into this. It's not just SSRIs, but you better believe that that's playing a huge role in people delaying marriage or having no desire to get married or, you know, even date seriously or anything. Um, We'll put the link to this article in the chat for you here and in the description to this episode. Anyway. That's that on that. Um, You need to read this and share it everywhere Uh, and also be sharing my Roger McFillin episode. I mean, a lot of you already have when that came out in December. But, you know, if you didn't listen, if you're if that's one that you haven't listened to yet, Gosh, it's it's so powerful. It's so impactful and it'll change your life. Um, even if you're not somebody that is on this medication, it'll change your life because you'll know how to talk to people, which absolutely every single one of us knows at least someone, friend or family who is on at least one of these. So um, it's it's imperative that you listen and share this episode now. 
Fun fact, fun note, sidebar, I do have a vlog coming out. I kind of hinted at it last time we spoke a couple weeks ago. I have a vlog coming out. I recently went to Charlotte. I went to Austin last week. Uh, and there's going to be a vlog on the Real Alex Clark YouTube. Won't be long. It's very funny. You'll, you'll get a sneak peek of just me traveling, getting into things, um, and also the next two weeks of spillovers as well because you get to basically see who I'm interviewing and some behind the scenes on that. The week, this week, I am interviewing one of the most powerful food activists. She has gotten craft to change. Uh, Chick-fil-A changed some ingredients because of her Subway, Starbucks, and more. She tells stories of being stalked at her home, uh, how speaking appearances that she does publicly. She's had people show up and try to intimidate her in the audience from Big Food. They're sent there to intimidate her into silence. How she was invited and went to Chick-fil-A headquarters because she called them out and they were not happy and they they brought her out to Chick-fil-A headquarters to discuss what she had said. That was, I was like on the edge of my seat for that. Um, She also draws some startling comparisons between big soda and the tobacco industry. The way that Coke and Pepsi run almost everything in this country is so chilling. It's so chilling. And I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was as bad as it was until I read her book. And it actually brought me to tears reading this section of her book because It's so evil. It's so evil and so corrupt that it's like I I, even in your wildest dreams, I feel like somebody couldn't even write this in fiction. It's so corrupt. That episode drops tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, anywhere you get your podcast. Subscribe to The Spillover. I am doing fun birthday tings this weekend. I'll bring you along for that on my Instagram at Real Alex Clark. Thumbs up this video, subscribe to Real Alex Clark on YouTube, and stay strong, queens, despite the persistent tummy aches. I'll see you next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. It's pop culture without the pop. It's it's pop culture. (laughs) It's pop culture without the propaganda. I'm Alex Clark, and this is Politics Live. 